Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Victory comes from finding opportunities in problems. Is a quote from Sun Tzu, the Chinese general, military strategist, writer and philosopher, the author of The Art of War. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today, as our guest has made a remarkable career in building relationships and closing deals all over the world, across borders, between different cultures, from presidents to prime ministers, from global CEOs to entrepreneurial giants. Ever an optimist and always seeking to find the opportunity in every problem. Our guest today is Trevor O. Ayo, former executive chairman of Rothschilds and Co. Australia. Prior there too, he was at Citigroup Global Markets and held numerous senior positions within Salomon Brothers over 23 years. He was chairman of UGL Limited, Resimac Group, Careers Australia Group, Bridge Connections, Queensland Bio Capital Fund Limited, Go Talk Limited, and the Queensland Investment Corporation. Trevor also served on the boards of the Future Fund of Australia and the Australian Securities Exchange Limited and was Chancellor of Bonn University from 2002 to 2009. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite, world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blender Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In a candid conversation, Trevor, armed with fascinating stories, shares with us his unique journey on how he made his way from humble beginnings in Perth. At a young age, he was given the mandate to tell people how great Trevor Rowe is. With enthusiasm, perseverance, a dash of good fortune, and the killer instinct, he set out on his quest and accomplished exactly that forging an international business career and becoming chairman of the world. Adept in managing relationships, he touches on the importance of education, understanding other perspectives, be it in brokering deals or balancing on the tightrope of geopolitics. We cover the international state of affairs, the global economy, and the new world. So sit back and enjoy, follow your instincts. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Trevor, where did it all begin for you? I believe you uh, grew up in back streets of Perth. Yes, I'm a Perth boy originally. My father was a bricklayer and my mother was a storekeeper. And so I grew up in a war, war reparations housing estate because my father was in Kokoda Trail and got oh, really pretty knocked around in that episode. And so uh, wow. we got these sort of benefits. So uh, that's where I went to school and grew up. So what were the values that they, uh, they instilled? Because obviously the old man must have seen the good, bad, and the Yeah, well, my, my father was very big on, he used to say to me, son, manners cost you nothing, remember manners. And he was strict, you know, you couldn't put your elbows on the table. He'd be horrified with the grandkids these days with iPhones <laughs> left on the table. Just wasn't on, he was pretty strict about it. He's very, I'd argue old fashioned would be the way kids would describe it, Dave. Big on manners, big on civility. So how does someone coming from that background pursue a career in investment banking? What were the, the turns and twists? Well, it was quite a, it's quite an ironic story, actually. You remember we had the junior certificate, the leaving certificate. Yeah. I did the junior certificate, and then my mother said to me, look, your father's not well because he had injuries from the war and he's on allowance, but we right. can't afford to keep you at school. Oh, is that right? And she said, now, look, son, you've got this wonderful imagination. You write these great stories. <laughs> You're going to go and sell yourself. Tell people what, how great Trevor Rowe is. And so she said, I'll help you. So we drafted up some letters and I applied for a job. And we we're all very excited because I applied for my first job I applied for was 
a messenger boy on a bicycle for a freight forwarding company. And we were so excited, I made the final two that I missed out. We were horrified. And uh, you missed out on that one. I missed out on it. So I, he said, well, look, look, son, perseverance, you know, carry on. So I did. My mother was a bit of a go-getter. Okay. You know, she worked herself up in a department store from a assistant to a department head. Yeah. So she had some grunt. So I applied for a, a spare parts trainee at a hardware store. And I went in and saw the CEO and he said, why did you write to me? You were told to write to the human resource people. The best thing I could think of, I need to bring my special attributes to your attention. <laughs> and he said, look, he said, I can see you, you're, you're captain of the football team and you play cricket and all this sort of stuff. He said, you don't pay much attention. You're the boy around town. He said, I suppose you like to drink. I said, of course. I said, I don't drink. I'm a teetotal. Oh, sorry. And, and he said, I suppose you chase girls. Well, what, what, what else do you do? <laughs> and he said, and don't pay much attention to studies. Well, I said, I got, I got through. He said, yeah, but look, you're not, you're not mechanically orientated or, or that sort of stuff. Why the hell do you want to be a spare parchment maintenance? So I said, oh, maybe I'm a, my father's a bricklayer. They said, why aren't you out bricklaying? I said, well, my father took me out and I didn't like it much too hard. <laughs> and so he said, look, you'd make a great accountant. You know what chartered accountants do? I said, no. He said, look, I'll get you a job at Pete Mark Mitchell, which is what it was then, KPMG, yeah. Yeah. now. And he said, on the basis, I will determine what you do at this course. And he said, I'm a the senior partner, a golfing friend of mine and a partner. I'm going to become your mentor. You, you know, I like you and I got something about Seriously. you. I'll knock you into shape. And he said, that's the deal. I will control your destiny and determine what exams you do. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to make the a football team here. And he said, well, I don't like football. And he had no children. And so he mentored me and got me into Pete Mike's. And that's when I found out about accounting. My parents didn't know anything about it. I remember he said to me, now you need to go, and get, go home, get into a suit. And I said, I don't own a suit. He said, okay, I'll get my PA to take you out, brought my first suit. And I said, oh, we can't afford this. And he said, don't worry, you'll pay me back. He ruined my football career because you know, he insisted I do all these bloody studies. And, but I really enjoyed it. I really took to it. I really enjoyed accounting. I was a rare bird because when I was out auditing, of course, which everyone starts with. Then I went to this sort of management of advisory side of Pete Marks. Yeah. So that's how I got started. And then um, just a, did some work for AC Good & Co, advising them on sitting up in Perth. I got off with a job. I took it on into stockbroking because I was passionate about that sort of, that sort of thing. And the guys... So it was a ALA, Mr. Arthur Good, the old old gentleman, yep. fine man. And it was great because, you know, we, got into, we did an IPO for Bell Brothers because the Bell Boys I knew from school. <laughs> and uh, it was great fun. And then the guy I worked with was under a Malaysian scholarship program, rang me one day and said, I'm setting up a bank in Kuala Lumpur with the Treasury. Come up, we need you. I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> so he said, look, I said, you're a free air ticket. I said, what the hell? So I flew up there and I went out and joined this startup bank. Uh, it was a joint venture between Arab money, remember in the 70s, yeah. And, oh, right, um, yeah. and the Malaysian government. And the chairman was an outstanding individual, Rajatan Sri Moha, who was a special economic advisor to the then Prime Minister. And we had all this backing from the Arab Bank, and we had a mandate in Malaysia to develop investment banking to go Asia-wide and represent things. So, And he was also chairman of Malaysian Airlines. We did a lot of work there, and wow. multi-currency Kuwait dinas and Bahraini dinas and... It was a very fascinating episode. It was very interesting and I, I loved it because what it taught me was how to deal with different cultures, yeah, okay. to deal with a Malay, to deal with a Chinese, overseas Chinese, to deal with an Indian are all very different styles culturally. If you want to get your message across, you've got to understand their culture and how they con consequently think about things. And that was a, what really struck me as a brush young Western Australian. That was the most important thing I learned from that exercise. And I loved the culture and I ate everything. I, they tested me with all sorts of strange foods. I ate everything from monkey brains to snake and you name it, I ate it. <laughs> and bugs in the work. And, and so that's what I loved about that. And, and so after a while there, I got headhunted to go somewhere else. And then I was securitizing debt. This was with a company called Private Investment Company for Asia, which was in Hong Kong and Manila. Yep. In the late 70s and then early 80s. And then along came... Um, uh, the guys from Solomon Brothers and other investment banks, I was using a, a securitizing product, enhancing it with add-ons from uh, IFC, the monetary fund and all this sort of stuff, and selling bonds, getting these guys to bid on them. So one day the Solomon Brothers guy said, geez, Trevor, why don't you come join us in New York? We want someone who could tell people about Asia and Australia. Yeah, right. And I also was talking to, uh, coming back to Australia for a very secure job as a head of corporate finance of a local stockbroking firm. And I had those two options. 
And uh, I said, and I said, talk to one of my friends, and he and I said, look, I think I'm going to take the risk. I want to see what working overseas in New York's like, the big city. Yeah, the big apple. And so my friend said, you're crazy. That's a high-risk strategy. So I went to join Solomon Brothers. <laughs> and after the first week, I was frightened shitless. <laughs> so, yeah, it was d different because yeah. that was a legendary John Goodfriend and yeah, right. aggressive firm. And uh, it was a great experience. And uh, I was there 26 years. So what was it like the day you walked in? It, into a Solomon Brothers? Yeah. Oh, very different. Um, transactions were gigantic in scale by the comparison what I was used to. Mm. The pace was fast. There was no, you know, no relaxation. There was pressure, pressure, pressure. And the, and the chem, John Goodfriend's legendary comments were, you know, are you making money? That's every time he met you, are you making money? He, the pressure was immense and to, to, to do deals and work out. But I kind of enjoy, very much enjoyed it. So where was your skill, Trevor? Are you the relationship man? Are you the, are you the one who can create the deal? Are you the innovator? Where, where? You, you can put it all together. Where, where's your skill? I, I, I'm fortunate. I enjoy b being with people yep. and, uh, and, and building these relationships and being engaging is crucial. You know, I learned a bit of Bahasa Malay, a bit of conversational Chinese, and I just kind of dress people like I'd walk into a room and say, Apakaba, which is how are you? Or, yep. you know, uh, Chinese and Mi Hao and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you engage with people. When you develop relationships, people trust you, particularly, and I learned this in Asia, the stronger the relationships are, you, that's how you build trust. And they will trust you once they develop these relationships. It takes time, yeah. it takes effort, and you've got to enjoy it. And if you don't really enjoy it or don't respect their culture, they can tell. And it, it, it reflects in the way they operate with you. So the art of the relationship. Do you want to talk us through that? You know, is there a lot of homework you did before you go to meet someone? Or is it natural if you... Or like, you know, you, you, you've got a track record. You've got a reputation, Trevor, for being unbelievably good at securing and building relationships. Well, that's what, what I saw there because I personally enjoy it. You, you, you have those native instincts and you, uh, you know, engage with people and you've got to think about and reflect on what they're about and who they are and how you develop the relationship. And some you really enjoy and you develop long-term relationships. And, you know, I've got a great advantage now throughout Asia. I've got lots of great relationships and other places and... Uh, back here in Australia, and I value those relationships, certainly. The life of the investment banker. So going back to those days, it must have been high-charged, fast-paced, long hours. Incredibly hectic, you know. I thought my life was this. Getting up at 4.30 in the morning, that's what I did. I gym for an hour, went to the office, then went out tonight. My wife said to me, oh, can't you go to the opening of a paper bag? But see, you know, I'm a, I was a great believer in being involved and around and see what's happening. But I also developed, living in Asia, a strong interest in geopolitics, Australia-Asia relationships, yeah, okay. crucial. So you become this specialist, did you, in that space, eh? Well, I, well, I, I wouldn't say a specialist. But you made yourself to come, you, I guess you built the reputation. I have a reasonable specialist. understanding, I think. <laughs> and look, I, you learn all the time. Yeah. And I certainly did. And in the US, and I'm a great admirer of the US, you know, the exceptionalism in the US was all about, exceptionalism is what it's about, the great post-World War II effort. Now it's a, a, a challenge and what's happening and it's very disconcerting. But my point is that it's all about relation. Relations are crucial. And you, know, you, get so, you meet certain people. You know, I remember I met Bill Clinton once, you know, I was told to go on a bloody trade delegation with him when I'm out in, living in Hong Kong. I was busy as hell. But you know, Warren Buffett said, you're going. So I went, you know, when you meet Bill Clinton, He's a brilliant policy. He looks right in your eye, takes you by the elbow and the hand. Mr. Rowe, I'm delighted to meet you. Can I call you Trevor? <laughs> yes, Mr. President. <laughs> and, and so it's a unique experience. And he's got that capacity to engage with you. John Howard remembers the name. Anyone he meets. John can, you know, haven't seen a person for 30 years and he'll remember his name. That's the relationship aspect, what makes people good and different. The buzz. The buzz of doing the deals. Are you a deal junkie? You know, and I would say I'm a junkie, but I love doing deals. And, you know, you know, I fondly reflect on the deals, some of the better deals I thought I did and some of the errors of your way. But, you know, generally, I, I, I try to do the right thing by the clients. And if you do that, that holds you in good stead. Any big fond memory? Any fond memories you want to share with us in pulling a significant deal together? You, you know, I, I thought I was with Solomon Brothers became Citigroup. We took yeah. on the sale of Sydney Airport. Yeah. which was a very sensitive asset that you'll appreciate. Yeah, Surrounded right. by Labor seats, crucial to Sydney, and the Howard government decided to uh, privatise it. And John Fay was the Minister of Finance. A lovely man, great guy to deal with. Uh, he could be up frank with him, he could be frank with him, up front with him, and 
engaged. And of course, we had 9-11 right in the middle of the process. And I recall the day I rang and said, John, I think we should not cancel the process. Ooh. We should suspend it so people didn't have to write off the cost of bidding. And I said, you've got an election coming up. You don't want this in front of you because, you, and I said, and finally, you'll lose control of your agenda. So John said, let me speak to the boss. So, you know, he, and the boss agreed and in the end, we got a, a great outcome. It was a great sell. And that was a, a great experience because what was happening at the time, 9-11 and the confusion in markets. And then, you know, one of my other fun deals is we, we sold Telecom New Zealand. We advised Bell Atlantic and Ameritech in buying that company. And we convinced the then government oh, yeah, right. to sell us 100% on the basis we'd sell down 51% by way of an IPO within two years under certain terms and conditions. That was a heck of a deal because, you know, I was, in, in, in a week I was traveling between Auckland and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Chicago back and forth. Uh, and it was a couple, a year of really intensive stuff. I spent most of my time in New Zealand. So you have fond memories of the, the people I got to know from America and Bell Atlantic. Some of them are still very good friends of mine. And it was a great experience working on those sort of, and other deals out, like my funniest deal ever is out of China. When I, when I, in Hong Kong, uh, China was opening up, they allocated two IPOs for each US investment bank. We got a, a power company and a glass making company. We went to the market and they, uh, took these guys through how we'd build a book and how we would do this. And we said multiple between 13 to 14 times earnings and blah, blah, blah. But book didn't build as strong. So I said, oh, we're gonna, we should back off now and say price it at 12 and a half to get some tension. They listened. No, no. They said, yeah, "We've thought we should go at 15. I said, "No, no, no, no!" <laughs> they wouldn't punch the bucket. <laughs> and, and so we finally got down to about 14, but we had to bite the bullet and take it to the market. Wow. We were quite experienced because you had to educate, you know, to a new process, and they wanted to have a better multiple than the next guy that just did the last deal. Yeah. Faced the system, they understood. I had to sell it to New York. I said, "I have to carry it on the books for you, and we'll have to work it off through other deals." But we built a relationship through the process of committing the capital to do it. So it's quite unique experiences. What's the difference in entre entrepreneurism between US, Europe, or UK, Europe, different parts of Asia and Australia? One, having been on the world, which yeah. was a ship that circumnavigates the world regularly, yep. privately owned by high alpha, high network individuals who yep. own apartments. Yep. And 54% of them were Americans, majority were entrepreneurs. America's a much more entrepreneurial than the average Australian. It's their culture. It's the nature of the, if you look at the history of the US, it's the nature of the beast. Also, there's a lot of private capital in the US, deep pools of capital. And you don't have that in Australia. That's increasing now as, you know, people like Twiggy Forrest doing a great job, yeah. spreading the wealth around, creating entrepreneurship. Yeah, right. But the US has been predominant in that area and they are highly motivated the stories from Americans, they'll take on one guy that had a, a lawn mowing business. The next one has got a washing machine business. And then he found a company that was having problems selling alternative debt products. They took over that. And amazing entrepreneurship. So they, they're not risk of it. They fail. They can still get capital. It doesn't hold them against them. Yeah, right. And that's a great difference. Now, that's hopefully emerging now in Australia. But it's very important. And the Americans are much more mobile in Australia. So they'll move around the country and do whatever is necessary. So, so, but entre, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation is, is the key to it. What about the other thing, salesmanship? Oh, it's, yeah, you've got to be able to sell, obviously. But That's America, but a long time ago, I think, Trevor, you and I caught up, and we talked about the add-on sale. I think you gave an example of when you go to a, uh, you walk down the street in New York, maybe Fifth Avenue, and there's a hamburger stand. That's right. Or there's a hot dog stand. That's right. And you, what do they do, Trevor, compared to what they do here? They do an add-on, add-on, add-on. So oh, they, yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> almost, you know, Consumerism in the U.S. is brilliant. It's individual. It's focused. You walk outside your building and walk Wall Street. You grab a hamburger. You know, sort of hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> you know, imagine walking outside here and there's a hot dog store. Yeah. A guy with a little van that's on your hot dog. Yeah, yeah. but you got a choice of what kind of bread, yeah, yeah, yeah. what kind of mustard. Yeah. Would you like a that's can right, of coke? Yeah. Would you like this? Yeah, this yeah, right. with with little here yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you know what I found it fascinating about New York was that, you know, I lived in Roosevelt Island. A great story here. I, I was. Down in was a lunatic asylum, and I took over the apartment of a guy who had been transferred to Latin America. So I looked back on Manhattan, it was very convenient. Yeah, wow. And so I'm sitting in the uh, coffee shop when they're having coffee, and this guy comes in, and he says, oh, Excuse me, it's 4.50, if I sit down. So I said to him, He said, well, What do you do? So I started engaging. He said, Well, he said, I'm in the asylum, I had a mental breakdown. 
And so we chatted. I found he's about normal as me. He turned out to be an ex-investment <laughs> banker. So we became great buddies. So I'd jog past the sale and he'd come out. We'd run around the place. And so uh, there you go. But that's, that's the US. It's a very interesting place. But, you know, you get up in the morning there at 4.30 and I, it became my mantra in my life. I always got up at 4.30 in the morning, gymmed or exercised, then, you know, got to the office or whatever. Uh, and in the US, you worked all day. And then, of course, you go out at night with the boys and to the Irish pub or the local pubs. And you go home at 9.30 at night and start the whole routine again next morning. It was, you know, the pace was quite extraordinary, but it was a great experience. I loved it. And in fact, when I was told to come to Australia to open up the office, I was reluctant because I was really enjoying living in the US. And I saw myself as principal investment banker, but the legendary John Goodfrey gave me two choices. Get on the next plane or you're fired. So it was a pretty simple decision. So I came down here. So and the, um, jumping on that airplane, firstly to Asia, then to the US, changed your life. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, change, the significant change in my life came was in Asia for the first time in the 70s. I sort of really saw the dynamics of the culture, uh, the opportunities, the prospects, the importance to Australia, the geopolitical issues and relative. And I, and I became chairman of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines and Hong Kong and that sort of stuff. So I got involved in those areas because I like that sort of uh, geopolitical de debate and discussion. Yep. Yep. Then when I went to the US, I saw another perspective, a much more sense of scale, urgency. Uh, you know, you're doing billion dollar transactions, whereas out in Asia, we're doing a hundred million dollar transaction, big difference. And, you know, I remember how excited I was. I went to Sabah and there was a guy that was a treasurer of the state of Sabah of Malaysia, a bond issue hadn't been done in, the, in domestic Malaysia to ring it terms. And he was actually educated at the University of uh, Tasmania. So he and I became good friends. I convinced him and his chief minister to do a float a local bond issue in Ringgit, the first ever done, you know, and it was a hundred million, a big deal. Yeah. Go to the US and they're doing my first day at the desk, we're working on a billion dollar trade for IBM. I was quite shocked. Scale was different. The urgency was different. It was fantastic. It's a great buzz. For five years in the US, I was under adrenaline, I felt. Is the, uh, is the deal making still as sophisticated and still as much fun as it used to be? Well, M&A in particular is still, I think, very interesting, a great career. Um, in this day and age, we're much, much more empathy towards the people who work for you and with you. In my day, you were expected to grind it out. Like working on Christmas was not unusual for me because yeah. that's what the deals demanded. Now, and pulling all-nighters two or three a week was the standard in the business. That's no longer, you know, much more empathy for the young people now. And that's, that's good because some people can't handle it and they burn out too quick. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty tough. It's very competitive. You're living by the sword. And dying by the sword. And absolutely. How did you arrive at Rothschilds? Well, I um, came back from Asia in about 2004 having been in Asia for 91 for that stint. I was in Hong Kong covering the region. And whilst I covered a very large region, you'll appreciate, mm. and we had China coming to the markets, we had India opening up. Like for example, we we pitched and won the uh, privatization for bringing VSNL, the long distance carrier in India to the marketplace. Oh, right, okay. Well, given Indian bureaucracy and all that stuff was a challenge, but I met and worked with Maman Singh, yeah. whilst became prime minister. A gentleman, an interesting man. His, his foible was he was too gentle, and uh, it took a while to get that to the marketplace. But so we had the India, we had China, Southeast Asia, and of course Indonesia. I'm very and I speak a bit of Bahasa, so very fascinated about what happens in Indonesia. Very important country to to relative to, to our interest here in Australia, and if we we neglect Indonesia at our own risk and peril. Indonesia is going to be increasingly important and a challenge, and so it was a wonderful region to cover. It was. Diverse from, you know, I didn't know, I covered everything south of Tokyo, to, including Australia. So it was diverse and fascinating. So when I came back to Australia, we had merged and become Citigroup. Solomon Brothers had merged with Citibank and became something. And the whole concept of Citigroup was to cross sell product. In other words, I'd go out and sell custodial arrangements as well as my M&A products and stuff. And it was very political because yeah, right. the legendary John Goodfriend and the then chairman of Citibank, uh, it was a very political association. And I, I was um, chairman of UGL on the board of the Stock Exchange. Yep. So I had a couple of public company interests and I'd been appointed chancellor of Bond University yep. uh, where 
and how I got involved in Bond University when I came to Australia to open up Solomon Brothers' office in the, in the mid '80s. I provided some scholarships because they, the then Vice Chancellor was from Western Australia, rang me and said we need some help, and I, I, I got I got over the line. I managed to get around the Bond name to New York, and we provided some scholarships. So I never even hand out these scholarships. And kind of love, I love the interaction with the students and the like. So I was up there one day, and the Vice Chancellor said, "Look, we're in a state of flux. You should take on the job as Chancellor. You're an enthusiastic, passionate." Fellow. So you know, I got persuaded to do that. I had a wonderful thing that was in a bit of a crisis, so I had a chance to reshape the council, which reduced it to eight people. Got on some very good people on board Catherine Greiner, Neil Bell Naves, oh, yeah. really good people. And um, we embarked on rebuilding Bond. It was a fascinating experience. So here I was spending a lot of time at Bond, at once initially about half my time, yep. hired a new vice chancellor, wonderful man, Rob Stable. We were a terrific partnership. He was passionate about it and I was enthusiastic. And being a private university I had the flexibility, public university didn't. And I must tell you that Peter Beattie and John Howard were amazing supporters of the initiatives out of Bond because they could come to Bond and do speeches without being interrupted and the like, because students are paying their way. Right? Yeah, right, yeah, right. And they could you know, get in a robust debate. So it was a wonderful campus, and, and Peter Beattie and John Howard were very supportive. Of, we built a medical center, which they supported. We built the first uh, uh, environmentally friendly building to teach uh, sustainability and all that sort of stuff. And we built a law center. I, I was uh, traveling around Connecticut, and I saw this dumb, stock exchange room where students worked on. And I was on the board of ASX and I said, wow. So I came back to Australia, got hold of Nicholas Moore at Macquarie and got them to fund a uh, link and I got ASX to link it in and we set this up this bond trading set. It was fabulous. And so we did lots of fascinating things. And so that was taking up a lot of time. Yep. So uh, I decided I'd had my run as an investment banker. I'm now going to be focused on education, public companies. And I was chairman of QIC and I'd just gone on the future fund which I found extremely interesting. Yeah, great it still for too long, do you? Future Fund is a great initiative of John Howard and Peter Costello's yeah, great absolutely. initiative. And Peter Costello's doing a great job as chairman. And so that was lots of fun. So I decided I'd retire. I didn't like the politics of the city group particularly, so I decided to retire. And one of my colleagues had gone over to Rothschild as head of industrial, and he mentioned to the Rothschild people, you should talk to Trevor Rowe. Get him to come in over here as chairman. And I knew, I knew the guys from... The days I'd you know bumped into them, I knew uh, uh, the English side of the Rothschild family. Yeah. So long and short, I had a conversation with them. I took on the job as chairman, and I had to sort the place out, and it was lots of fun. And Rothschilds is very different from what I'd been used to. Exactly, I've nice been used to a fully integrated investment bank. Yeah, equity underwriting, debt underwriting, derivatives, swaps, like Rothschilds is purely advisory. 450 odd years of history yes, right. and the empathy for its clients and its people was just so different and Baron David Rothschild who was the then chairman is a wonderful man and you know he explained to me you know they are the custodians for the legacy of the Rothschild family my task was to make sure in Australia we looked after the reputation and in Asia of, uh, of Rothschilds have empathy for your people and your clients he never once said to me, are you making money? Whereas all the chairman of Solomon Bros. did ask you, how much money are you making? And it was a different kind of culture. And it is a different culture. And I, I very much enjoyed this sort of that period. And I came in then, I sort of became part-time executive chairman. And you know, we did some very nice business. We did the privatizations for the um, you know, Queensland government, all those asset sales, which yeah. were massive over three years. Yes. Peter Beattie showed great courage and Anna Bly in doing that. And uh, it was very beneficial, I thought, ultimately. So we did lots of good business, and uh, it was a very, very fine group to work with. We've seen a bit of the good, bad, and the ugly scene crisis. So let's go back. So 9-11, where were you? 9-11? Yeah. Um, I was in Asia. What was the impact? It was chaos and yeah. bedlam. I was very concerned about friends of mine who were Absolutely. in the little trade buildings. I knew some Australians who were in there. Of course, they all got out. But it was a, it was a very disruptive period. Very great uncertainty. I was back in Australia by then. And so it was quite a shock uh, to the system. The other great thing you were across was the, uh, the handover, Hong yeah. Kong. Oh, that was a fascinating event. What, what, I remember, what, what, was it like on the ground? what a funny story. I, went to, I got invited by Alice Chan, who is the, the then chief secretary. And it raining cats and dogs, but you weren't allowed to take your umbrellas in because they were worried about security. 
And so I'm standing around the rain in my suit getting wet, and I talked to this Chinese friend of mine and said, gee, this is very dreadful. Prince Charles is going to get wet. No, he said, rain's a sign of fertility. This could work out well. So then we had to rush back that night. And we went to the opening ceremony, you know, the handover ceremony, which was quite something. Yeah. And I looked up at the, at the ceiling, and there was the British flag sort of laying, you know, limp on the thing. There's yeah. the Hong Kong flag. And I thought, curious, the Chinese flag was waving in the wind. Oh. The guys had put a, the Chinese had put a fan in front of their flag, so it waved, and it was, I thought, now there's attention to detail that we don't think about. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the Chinese attention to the detail in promoting their cause. And it was a fascinating exercise. And in the context, if I could comment just on Hong Kong. Yeah, go for it. There was great anxiety at the time about would this work? Some people hedged themselves by leaving. Some got dual passports. And the bulk basically stayed. And of course now, with the Communist Party and under Xi Jinping's approach to leadership, one country, two systems is just not what it was. And now that young Hong Kongese have denied their... Uh, democratic rights yes and they didn't grow up at, you know they've grown up in that era yeah. and Chinese just find this unacceptable that they, you know because under Xi Jinping back to Mao Zedong the party is superior to everything superior to the government to the military to the bureaucracy everything's loyal to the party the party determines everything including including the judiciary which of course is not something Hong Kong Chinese are familiar with yeah, right. and so the big question now what happens in Taiwan that's the big risk yeah because that's in the Chinese DNA. I said from the outset, I remember when John Howe became Prime Minister, I was chatting to him and I told him, look, it's in the Chinese DNA. And Xi Jinping wants to take sovereignty. He's furious now with Trump's support of, uh, of Taiwan. Taiwan's been a major investor in the Fujian province there and, and the like trade's pretty important to Taiwan, but yep. they like their independence and particularly the younger people. And so the question is, what sort of mischief does China get over in this nasty U.S. election that's coming up? Because in the, I believe whoever wins, there'll be lots of confusion and protests. Because if Trump wins, the left are going to be mighty unhappy. And if Trump loses, his, the right are going to be very unhappy. There'll be lots of confusion and tensions. What will the Chinese do in this period? That's what worries me most. And it won't be, they won't, I, don't, I don't believe they're going to frontally attack Taiwan, but they'll endeavor to usurp. Uh, from within Taiwan. If you're giving advice all those years ago to, to Prime Minister Howard, what advice would you give to the current Prime Minister on the way, on the way that you know we should deal with China and our and our yeah. allies in, yeah. in Asia and in the broader broader perspective? Look, I, I think generally allies. Scott Morris has done a fine job. He's exceeded my expectations. He's become father of the nation during the pandemic, and the budget is a budget he had no alternative. He had to throw everything at it, yep. and he's done that. You're impressed by that, eh? I'm impressed they had the courage to do what they had to do. This is this is so contrary to liberal philosophy. This is good old-fashioned massive Keynesian at work. Yeah. Now, my question is how we manage this in the future is another challenge, of course. But he had no alternative. He's got to get these Aussies back to work. And it's going to be a challenge because this pandemic's changed the way we operate, changed the way consumers buy things, how they think about things, what value propositions. There's changes taking place here. It'll be very challenging. All the jobs we thought were relevant aren't going to be relevant anymore. Yeah. Stay at home, work at home, suddenly it looks workable. Can you build cultures with people working at home? Culture starts from the bottom up, not from the top down. That's been one of the problems in Australia. It has been recognised. You've got to have your people believing in culture and and in this day and age, that's been sadly lacking. I was one of the ones that said we didn't need an inquiry into the four banks. I was totally wrong. Clearly, they needed that a cultural problem. Yeah. And something happened. Culture you got eroded as a result of the wealth management acquisitions. They got eroded because all these salesmen aren't selling product and everything. And, you know, they're all trying to generate revenue and taking shortcuts. Yep. And the boards didn't appreciate that cultural shift that was taking place. And so it's a real challenge for everyone now. And so these are the changes that are going to take place. So I thought the budget was very appropriate. He had no alternative. He had to do it. Yep. And he's done it and had the courage to do it. Now, I think it's going to be up for business now to take up the slack and get on with it. That means building consumer confidence. That's what Morrison and Feinberg are doing. So, yeah, but what do you want business to do, Trevor? Well, business has got to step up now. And what does that mean? St well, ah, business has got to think about post the pandemic, what's yep. the new normal look like? Because it's not the old normal. We've been through extraordinary and unfamiliar times. Now we got to think about where do we have our, 
our particular advantage. What's our competitive advantage? Yep. What do consumers want? What do customers want? How we reorganize our supply lines? There's a major challenge, Greg. You think yep. of reorganizing those supply lines. Enormous. Now, I know people, friends of mine, who are in business here that I'm helping out who are procuring product from China. So far, these direct, notwithstanding the relationship, these supply lines are working fairly well. Yep. But the Chinese want to punish us because of our relationship with the U.S., but they can't. They need iron ore, so that's fine. They won't touch that until the Brazilians Brazil get back comes on board. Yeah. Until Brazil comes back yeah. on board, and then there'll be change. Yeah. But on other products like beef and other stuff, and you know, they're going to punish us. But they need us still, and we we need to develop that relationship. And, and you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I wouldn't want to quote John Howard, but I, John, I think understood that. You know, he once said, "The things you can't do with China." Look. What we, in our enthusiasm to bring China into the world with the WTO, we forgot 5,000 years of totalitism. You know, they, they were warlords. They didn't have dem dem democracy, was just an alien to them. But, so we thought they'd move from a totalitarian regime yes. to a free uh, rules-based global system. Well, they didn't shift. 5,000 years of culture. Well, that's where we made a mistake. So we need to understand, as, as I believe John Howard did, that there's things you can't change. You're not going to convince them to do that. So you work on the things you can make changes with and you try to influence them and encourage them not to be, uh, you know, their human rights abuses. It's like having a grandmother you don't particularly like or a mother-in-law you don't like. No point bagging and complaining about it all day. You find the ways to work with her. Yeah, and right. that's the way I build relationships. Yeah. If someone disagrees with me, I will find out. I get their views. I explain my views and discuss it. That's what you've got to do. Yeah, right. And that has fallen down, I believe. You say that's fallen down. Where has it fallen down? Is it lack of dialogue, the wrong dialogue, the wrong support team we're partnering with? The, the wrong rhetoric, ill-disciplined rhetoric, and press and free press is very important to us, but yes. the Chinese will never understand that. But you need to have people that they trust constantly talking to them, explaining our position, dialogue with them. We haven't done enough of that. So where do we stand in regards to those islands being built? Those in the in the South China Sea, yeah. Well, they've been militarized, and that That's was right. a great shame. You know, Obama famously said, "I asked President Xi Jinping not to militarize the South China Sea. He's told me he would not." Mm. Well, Xi Jinping goes back to China and says, "Boy, I just outmaneuvered that enemy." That's he, right. He doesn't, obviously, no one taught Obama about Confucius law, and and they militarized all those bases. And the big question now is, you know, freedom of navigation. That's the real issue. Because from a military perspective, I think that's, that's a big deal. One missile takes them out. But the point being is, it's the trade that flows through that part of the world. And so it's very important now that where the U.S. is, this lack of global leadership, I think you know, under Biden, it's going to be the same. It'll be much more civil, but I don't think it's going to be decisive because Obama wasn't a decisive. Yep. I don't think it's going to be decisive. And the benefit of Donald Trump is he called out the Chinese, he called out NATO, he called out Germany. That's right. But his execution, and as an individual, he's less than desirable. Yes. And very volatile, and he's very transactional. It's not strategic. Yes. Biden will be have more strategic, but I think it'll be fairly benign. So I think these regional groupings like the Quad and other regional groupings within Asia are crucial to Australia. I like this initiative into the Pacific. I like these initiatives in Asia with the Quad. And that's very important to us. So we're going to walk this line. Now we need to engage. We need to step up and get people who the Chinese know and trust to dialogue with us and to talk to us behind the scenes. Not an open, behind the scenes. Where, where's Belt and Road going to go to? Well, Belt and Road is a is state capitalism at its best. And if you look at Chinese history, it almost back to the tribune system where China said, if you behave yourselves, we'll take care, look after you, and we'll trade with you. That's right. Yeah. And that's what Belt and Braces is kind of extending to Chinese influence. Yeah. And Xi Jinping, you know, it's his initiative, and he says a great initiative. A lot of money has been wasted on it, though. Right. And it's become a bit of a marginal proposition to some people because they use Chinese labor, they take control of assets right. under their deals. And, you know, Sri Lanka now, the port and the power stations are all, they, got, they built those. For, for the Sri Lanka government, couldn't pay the debt. Now they've taken possession of them. You know, it could be, you know, it could be misinterpreted. And could be a bad situation. The outcome. So, you know, people like India is circumnavigated. You think it's circumnavigated now by it's got Sri Lanka under the influence of the Chinese, the Maldives, Pakistan, yep. Nepal. Yes. And so Indians are pretty worried. Yep. But they've got this tricky balance between non-aligned, Russian-supported. And they try to move gradually into the sphere of the, the U.S. So the quad becomes even more important in that context, not as a containment exercise, but as a, 
a, a security apparatus to give us balance in the in the region is very important. Bringing Japan into the world is crucial. More in, international engagement. Abe, I think, was a wonderful prime minister from an international perspective. Okay, he's even even economics didn't quite work as well as he had hoped. But the point being, he had the right ideas. And, he, and this, if this new guy carries on, that'll be good. So, if you were foreign minister now, Trevor, where would you encourage for the next five to ten years for us to seriously build our our relationships? Well. I'm a great believer that we have a geopolitical, historical relationship with the U.S., which is crucial and important to so us. We, so we don't ever lose that. And secondly, we have this very important trading relationship with China. And we must endeavor to nurture both those relationships without getting them into, into competition. Yeah, and we must be able to seem to be independent. Now, Scott Morrison's government's trying, I think, quite well to demonstrate we aren't necessarily doing exactly what the U.S. wants. We have our own views. We need to step up our in personal engagement. Those Australians who have relationships with the Chinese should be encouraged to talk to the Chinese, communicate more, and develop relationships in terms of where we go to in this relationship. China's going to be a factor in the world. It's going to be very important to us. We need to be able to talk to them. It's going to be the biggest economy. Huge challenge. Very large economy. Very complex issues. And they've got a bit of, they've got overreach. They've got their own internal problems as well. Which is kind of, you know, you know, you know, Xi Jinping doesn't get home, I suspect, sleep in bed and say, oh, I've got everything under control. He's about as worried as everyone else. He's got to create jobs for a lot of Chinese. And I look, I talk to Chinese students. I keep in touch with them. Yep. And I ask them what they think about democracy versus their state capitalism. Yep. And they'll say, well, gee, having been the striker, young men and women that have done PhDs at Bond who are back in China. And, and, and they say, gee, democracy is very messy. Uh, and, you know, the Chinese worry about disorder, and they see this this, this liberal democracy system very disorderly. And so as long as Xi Jinping provides jobs, cleans up the environment, which he's paid attention to, yes, 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 the, and in, in they grow their incomes, they'll be happy with it. They're not as, you know, Chinese by culture is not as big on the issues like we are the liberal issues. So you think Xi Jinping's safe? Because there was rumours going around that there was a bit. I of, think uh, I think I don't think he's likely to be think he's out of a job at the moment. But he, he's got his enemies. Not, they're not able to influence outcomes right now. But he's got his challenges. What happens then, Trevor, if we roll it forward, just as you mentioned, and they do get seriously in bed with Brazil, which they're going to, where do we stand then? Well, if these big super iron ore tankers work, that's another big if, uh, and they get them working productively and Brazil can sort out its supply arrangements, yes, it'll be a challenge to us price-wise for our iron ore. Our iron ore is still good quality stuff. Uh, it'll be a challenge. We won't. In, I don't. I think if we won't enjoy the prices we've seen now in ore in the next five years from now that we enjoy now. It'll be a different game. Okay. We so need to be smarter about our exports. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So, what do we do? You see, you said business to step up a bit earlier. Yeah. yeah. Think about new industries. Well, we need, we need to improve our. We need to dialogue with the Chinese and find a way. And it's not easy. I'm not saying this is. Uh, this is a real challenge. Dialogue with the Chinese more effectively. Yeah. To find ways to do that. Secondly, we need to be diversify our exports. Yeah. Pay more attention to that, you know. India, Japan, South Korea, we do well there. Need to do a lot more. Okay. And we need to innovate in terms of product, our exports. Like, and we're very good at services, education, uh, and, and finance, and that sort of stuff. Need to, you know, we need to invest in innovation in, a, in an export context. But can we get to scale manufacturing? Because the cost of labor is so expensive, the cost of energy is so expensive. We, we will bring some essential manufacturing in. That's the, the result of the pandemic to the world is essential services will need to be manufactured domestically in vis disruption. But we'll still have to rely on other supply lines and because we're not, we're not going to be competitive. We need to be, we need to focus on those areas where we have a competitive advantage and we can innovate. That means educating our population to a high standard and making sure we have an immigration program that brings in the skills. Our productivity over the last 10 years is bound by immigration and the contribution immigrants have made. Yep. And uh, even our stinky dioceses have conflict on both sides. We're, we're immigrants, yep. but we, know, we must encourage the right people to visit us in the country. It's important for the future. It's how it will drive productivity. And we've got to be more innovative. We've lost the refor reform zeal right now. Yeah, exactly. And we need to regain that uh, re reform zeal. If you go back to your days in, in Asia, you, you must have covered a little country called Singapore which was a swamp, which yeah. was a British port. Yeah. Yeah. What did you take away watching 
how they came from nothing? Oh, look, it was wonderful. I lived in Singapore for a year or so in my that period in Asia in the 70s. And what I was stunned is that uh, how thoughtful the government was in terms of what's next. What does a small city town, sovereign country yeah. do to have a competitive advantage? Well, decided on getting into uh, semiconductors and the like. And they they provided educational programs for their student, their, their, their people, their students, and they invested in infrastructure to build infrastructure. And so Tamasac in particular, yeah. uh, they drove that investment into competitive global semiconductors. So Singapore's always looked at where the next opportunity is. And when they open up the casinos, they want to bring tourists in, add value. They open up that casino. And that's done very well in Singapore. And so they're constantly looking for where's the next value added proposition. We need to do things like that. We need to be smart. They have a tax system that's friendly to business and innovation. We need to have the same. And this current budget has some of those elements in it. it doesn't have the form elements because Scott Morris is more focused rightly on creating jobs and getting the economy moving again. But the next step is we've got to visit reforms and move the country forward. Have you been impressed by the leadership of the, the state premiers? Oh, I'm very impressed with our state premier, Gladys. Premiers. Premiers. Yes. Uh, I'm very impressed with <laughs> Gladys. She's done, I think she's done a terrific job. She's been balanced, firm when she needs to be, practical, and she understands the balance between the economics and the pandemic crisis. This is unusual. This is an economic crisis brought on by a pandemic. Yes. And these are unfamiliar times. They're extraordinary times, but they're also unfamiliar times. I think she's adapted well. Vis-a-vis -vis Singapore, and as for the Queensland Premier, I, I'm, I'm appalled. They must open up these borders. And as a Western Australian, I'm appalled with what's going on there. We must open up our borders. Now, internationals, and there's the other big border to be opened up. That's yeah. going to be a challenge, but we're going to have to address that sooner than later. And the real question is, when does this vaccine become available? And will it be effective, or will it be simply like a flu vaccine? It'll deal with particular strains, but you'll still need to be looking at it. We might well have to live with a pandemic going forward and learn to do that. I think that's what we're going to... I had an interesting call this week, Trevor. I had a CEO, well-known CEO, giving me a call regarding a certain matter. And at the end of the conversation, that person said, I think we're very close to a golden era, a golden era of growth. I said, well, what do you put that down to? Well, roll it back, go back to the last pandemic, the Spanish flu, known heavily invested like governments are now during that period of time. World War II, we spent a lot of money investing into Japan, the re rebuild of Japan and the rebuild of Western Germany. But stand back and look at all the investments done by governments around the world now. It's a huge amount of money in this market. That's got to spin off and give us growth. I think we're on the edge. It'd be great if we get this vaccine. I still think we're on, a, we're on the verge and the precipice of a golden era. And I thought, fantastic news goes against a lot of negativity I'm hearing out there. But this person was got a tremendous track record. I won't say that person's name. But I was wondering what your thoughts would be in that regard. Well, I think we're in a historically fortunate time. We have really? incredibly low interest rates. Therefore, it's kind of interesting. Everyone's going on about this trillion dollar plus debt we're going to have. But actually, the cost of the debt to the budget is actually on a trend line lower. Why? Because interest rates are at a historically abnormally low levels. Okay. And the central banks... Look, you take the U.S. Federal Reserve. Yep. It's financed roughly 80% of the deficit in the U.S., which is up to $3 trillion. Yes. It's even buying mortgage products, trillion mortgage products this year, because they can hold these indefinitely. The rates are so low. And corporates can borrow. Personal people can roll over their debt and borrow lower. That creates a great opportunity for the government to do what it's done, provide this capital, yep. and provide for opportunities for business now to take advantage of it. Now, this will change when inflation re-emerges, of course, but, you know, to me, that's five, six years off. I, don't, I just don't see any reason why we're going to have massive inflation. So the real question is, where do we create demand? What do we, how do we create demand for our products? Yeah. How can we, can we, we need to understand what the ultimate consumer wants and needs in this new environment. You know, how does he go, how's he going to fly? How's he going to entertain himself? How's he going to work? And you've got to address these issues and build this new normal thinking about what's relevant to this new area. If we can come up with that, we could be in a very good position. And have we got the, have we got the will to do it? Are you seeing, you know, does it, you come, you've lived overseas. You've seen that the, the Americans will turn it on pretty quick. You're seeing how across Asia, incredibly dynamic, incredibly fast paced, entrepreneurial from the day they're literally born. 
compared to Australia, where he'd been covered in red, red tape, smothered in it for a long time. Risk averse here in this country. country. Yeah. So are they, I hear what you're saying, but are we going to so we we, get on with it? We, we've suffered with a culture of lack of mobility, lack of risk taking, expecting governments to look after us and hand everything out. That's yeah. changed dramatically. I think the younger people are definitely different. Yeah, okay. I worry about the value systems of the fr liberal governments of the world, democracy. I think the fundamental values are under challenge. Yeah. Truth under challenge. It's not good. And so we need to, you know, we need leaders who can lead now and bring us forward. And I think the business community is in a chance, it's got a unique opportunity to take advantage if it thinks. But in the end, you've got to build something that people want. You've got to produce something they want. You've got to do it innovatively and deliver it. And I think Australians are much more innovative than we give ourselves credit. We need to get the governments to wind back some of this bureaucracy, yeah. uh, make it easier for, uh, for a business. And, and you know, look, small and medium business like in the US generates most of the jobs. That's, most right. of the, that's yeah. the crucial. Courage that entrepreneurship. Yeah. That's where it's at. And I think this budget's endeavouring to do that. I think they got that message. You know, I don't believe Scott Morris is a, a great reformer by nature, no. but he's changed in terms of doing what he thinks he needs to do, providing the capital and the environment for business, particularly small business, to take advantage of it. And, and that means we're going to get the economy moving. How do you get the economy moving? You're going to get people back in jobs, then they buy stuff, and then you're going to produce. That's the circle. So I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. Okay. I'm hopeful. Now, you've had the, the luxury of being an investment banker and I'm sure pitched to many great chief execs and political leaders. You've been a chair of a number of organisations and member of the boards. What is a leader to you? Well, I think a leader is someone who is engaging, is thoughtful, and in that process of being engaged and thoughtful, yep. uh, needs to be insightful as well. And not everyone has those attributes, I've discovered. Who's impressed you? Who's been the ones who stand out, the best leaders you've oh, engaged with? Amongst a, a, a number of leaders, there was some ladies that I've been a wonderful opportunity to work with. For example, when I moved to AC Good & Co, as a very young man in the late 60s, yep. I reported to a lady. It was quite an unusual back then experience, but I learned to respect her capabilities, her approach, and her discussions. And of, of recent times, there's a number of very capable ladies. And you know, I think of Belinda Hutchinson, the Chancellor of the University of Sydney. I spent so much time helping women, working with women. When I was mentoring, I could always call on her Helen Nugent was another one. And so these people are, you know, engaged and positive in terms of encouraging people and providing leadership. And, you know, when I was living in Asia, I became very close friends with Ho Ching, the Prime Minister's wife, Chairman of Tamasek. Wonderful lady, tough as old boots, very clear vision, very pro Singapore and developing the country. So some very capable people. In terms of political leadership, in my lifetime, I've been very impressed with John Howard. I think he's done an outstanding job, did a great job as Prime Minister, set the stage, and had a good partner in Peter Costello as Treasurer. It's a good combination. Worked for a long time, very successfully. In terms of business-wise, you know, a lot of overseas people I've met that, you know, are very impressive. And I've enjoyed that relationship, you know. Bob Denham, who is the Warren Buffett's senior lawyer, chairman of Mungers and Toll. I asked him to join the board of UGL, which he did for a number of years. And he's on the board of Chevron. He's a fine man. Clear thinking, uh, thoughtful, great stature, and great to engage with. And he and I are good friends. So there's a number of people around the world. I've got a Japanese friend I worked with for years who is uh, 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 USA, uh, 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 from the USADA clan, fine gentleman, thoughtful impressive, different perspective, different approach. He was my boss at one stage, this particular guy. And I learned, no point in ringing you and saying, I need to get this done. He didn't operate that way. You gotta say, on the Monday, well, I think we should think about this. And Tuesday, discuss it. And then Friday, he comes around the view, I think we should do that. And that's how you deal with it. So you can learn to deal with these people. But that's, that's the fascinating, the diverse of, you know, relationships. And, you know, on the ship, I had the luxury of knowing a lot of high alpha, high net worth, very successful entrepreneurs and people. And they all have the same foibles as you and I, but they have something special about them. They're risk takers, they're entrepreneurial, they're clear thinkers. Now, they tend to think their, 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 their way is the only way, which is 
It's probably to five, five assists. Yeah. Can I guess for arrogance there? You've got to yeah. beat that arrogance down. Arrogance is not acceptable. But they are generous to a fault in terms of what they support and charities and the like. And I remember, um, was it Bernie Sanders said we're going to eliminate billionaires? Yes. Yeah, and right. someone said, well, okay. Bill Gates provides billions of dollars for medical programs right now. Who's going to replace Bill Gates if you eliminate him? That's the point. Americans have this, oh, it's tax, tax beneficial, but they divest their incomes and do it. You know, I cannot believe the number of hospitals Americans supported that I was on the ship. 300 million to the Cleveland Clinic, 200 million to the US in New York Central. The money they poured into these facilities. What it's ended up with, of course, it's a fragmented health system in the US, unfortunately. We're very benefit. We've got a great health system here, some great people in it, and it's not as fragmented. And the other thing I'd like to say in this context, I'm on a roll here, it's yeah, great, no, you don't yeah. is that I'm very worried about the polarization in the United States. People are polarized very heavily to the left or the right, and the center is being eroded. Well, it's going left, more left, and more right, isn't it? Absolutely. And see, what's going to happen in this election if Biden wins, the Trump 36% are going to be mighty unhappy. There'll be protests. And if Trump wins, the left are going to be very unhappy. America is very polarized right now. And it could go so, to court, couldn't it? And we need, the, we need the next judge to make the decision. And that's, the, that's, <laughs> that's a challenge. The other problem is inequality of wealth. That is becoming a severe problem. See, quantitative easing in uh, 07, 08 yeah. was wonderful. But what it did is lifted asset prices. And so consequently, if you owe long assets in the 07, 08 crisis, you did very well. If you weren't long assets, you didn't do so well. You, in fact, your income, real income, declined. And so that's the conundrum. We've got to address that issue. This is a global problem that requires urgent address. We have a multilateral, you know, I'm a great believer of, we need an agency that effectively can address the issue globally of inequality of wealth. Big job, but you can't keep going on like this. Is there any sort of formal or informal agency in tackling it at all that you know of? I, I know the IMF and the World Bank have talked about it and written about it and are trying to do something, but it needs to be a global effort leadership. See, that's going to be the problem. In the next decade, who's going to provide this global leadership? The US provided after World War II. Yeah. Global, globalization left a lot of people out of poverty. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. But the rules-based system works so well. It's highly fragmented now. We're going to end up with a rules-based system alongside a state capitalism system. You're going to have democracies. Western leadership is under stress. Yeah, it is. U.S. is retracted. Biden is going to be as, as protectionist elements in like rebuild America again and Trump's America first, competing with China, who's built and make you know, China great again. Yep. So they're all pursuing their own agendas. Then you've got the mischief from the Russians and the Turks. And, you know, Aragon sees the Ottoman Empire again. That's right. And so the world's highly fragmented right now, so I don't know how this... This is a big challenge. It's a very period of considerable uncertainty. But Europe's leadership is just... The EU doesn't work no. in a leadership perspective. Well, what are the Russians doing? Well, the Russians, of course, are spoilers. And... Uh, but they, but they move nicely into the Middle East. Well, because, you know, well, maybe... You, God bless them. We didn't do so well ourselves, the Western world, did we? No. And then a huge mistake was the Iraqi war. That's high, in hindsight, absolutely huge mistake. So that's going to be the challenge, how the world order functions, how we address some of these problems. So we've got lots of major problems coming out. And I, I do agree with our Morrison's forward defence strategy. It's defensive. We've got to be forward thinking in our defence uh, approach. We've got to build these multilateral relationships. Very crucial talking about business playing their role. You're a former chair. You've been a board director. Would you want to go back to an ASX listed board these days with the amount of reading that you've got to do? And in fact, I approached the director just recently on a um, search and that person said, I don't want to be a compliance officer anymore. Find me something where I can add some value. As I said earlier, Greg, I saw my life as I got up at 4.30 in the morning. My wife loves telling this story, so. Got up at 4.30 in the morning, gym like buggery. Rushed to the office, worked all day, went to the opening of paper bag, you know, all these events. And on the weekend, you know what I did? I sat down and read board papers. I had piles of board papers, QIC, Future Fund. I read all these diligently and went through them. Well, they were these days only that big. These days are this big. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I got approached by a, a major board and I was asked, was I interested? Basically, a, a fancy compliance officer at board level. Yeah. And so the risk reward's not there. So I'm much more selective now. Um, why, are the, why are the directors and chairs saying it? 
Why, why, why are we losing our way here? Because we're spending, are we spending the right amount of time proportionally business compared to governance? Well, I think business has been caught out. The Royal Commission, the banks, put us yeah. all on the back foot yes. about our culture and our ethics. And on the challenge, there's been some terrible corporate situations like burning down artifacts of Aboriginal people and destroying it. So we, we've terrible. been on the back foot. And so that's our bit wrong. We're going to get back on the front foot now and bring some empathy and values back into the processes. It's a challenge. And so you know, I think some of these young entrepreneurs are the, the future here. You know, I look at some of the, I love engaging with young people yep. and it's very important that we bring them along and educate them, provide opportunities. And it's very important for business to step up now. And we've got some good business people around the place. You're a chancellor of the university, as you said. Mm -hmm. What are the universities gonna do now? Wow. Talk about a challenge and The half. mistake that was made by m most universities is they relied, they built a reliance on overseas students. Enormous. And you had some universities went whole spolos into Indian students or Chinese students and the like. Now, we at Bond had a policy of diversification. We had 6,000 students and at one stage, 72 different nationalities. Now, it was an expensive marketing program because it was diverse, yeah. but that's held us in good, the university in great stead. And that the two subsequent chancellors to me have done a great job managing that. And so the universities have a problem now. They've overexpanded, overleveraged, got themselves long on assets and not the resources. So the government's handed out significant research. Universities are going to be much more proactive in getting private enterprise to engage with them. That's been encouraging. There's a lot of people with various ventures with universities on medical research or engineering or more of that has to be done. Yep. Universities university have to be much more agile. We've got some high quality people in this country on the education front do a wonderful job, but we need to get them to be more proactive and engage with the business community. We need the business community and the tertiary sector to work closer together. Are you talking about a bit like the, well, a bit like the US? Yeah, more like the US. What, what, what is your thoughts in regards to the status of universities and the role of universities? Have they become too much of a business, Trevor? Well, they have by necessity, but then they got themselves hooked on the, uh, the problem because they needed these big overseas cohorts to finance themselves. And I think we're going to have to see our students paying more for education. I do. Yes. Mm, okay. And government's going to have to play a role there as well. And, you know, that's going to be so crucial. Education is the cornerstone of building a great country. Yep. Can't stress that enough. And that's just going to have to be the mantra. And times are going to be different. It's not going to be the hordes of overseas students. Who's going to win the US election, Trevor? Well, you've got to say at the moment, it looks like Biden, given the polls. But it's you really very, yeah, but not everybody's going to say, I'm going to vote for Trump, are that, they? I was just going to add that. <laughs> yeah, and most people don't want to talk about they're going to, they support Trump, but they do. And, you know, educated, very wealthy people I talk to say they like what Trump's done in terms of makes the big calls on tax, yep. China, NATO, Germany. They just don't like the way he goes about it. So they don't want to tell too many people they want to be tired with it, but they'll vote for him. So it's going to be close, I think. Trump's his own worst enemy, of course, with tweets and the way he carries on. 42,000, <laughs> 43,000, whatever it is. Oh, no. And, uh, you know, Biden's a decent man, but, you know, I don't see a lot of zeal for global leadership here. Mm. I think you'll be a benign, passive individual. Personally, I don't think either of the ideal candidates from an ally international perspective. But we're going to have to live with whoever wins. That's the important thing. Got to be able to gauge with either of them. And if Biden and the regime will be more civil, Trump's much more transactional and volatile. You never know where you stand with him. And so we're going to have to learn to adjust to either of these two. We're going to have to live with them and encourage them. And, and we, we as Australia, well, what, what we in Australia have an extreme if I can just say don't underestimate how much influence we have as Australia. We listen to Americans like Australians. We've always gone alongside them where we've done battles and all this sort of stuff. Yes. They like Australians. And so we need to use that influence to, you know, to endeavour to move the US in directions we think are, are relevant to our respective national interests. But from your experience living in the US, do the Americans actually think about the political side and the international affairs, or they're more worried about the economy? Americans are very domestic focused. What, what was that sign someone once said in a political campaign? It's the economy, stupid. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it is. In so the that, end. That's where Trump may have the upper hand in that regard, do you think, or not? Well, he's, he's muffed it in the pandemic. Yeah, he has muffed it. And it's, this, these, these incentives, fiscal incentives, will be 
very and a bad email the other day when he said he was going to not engage any long longer with the Democrats. Yeah, the polarization in the U.S. is just you know so such fragmented. But the agreement. Democrats are going incredibly left, aren't they? Oh, they've been dragged to the left. You know, Bernie Saunders and all these people. Um, you know, it's not good. So that's what's about the polarization. The U.S. has gone left and right, hard right and hard left. That's going to be the protest is going to be, I think, quite extraordinary. Now you've had an amazing last couple of years, haven't you? Indeed. You've been uh, sailing around the around the world on a ship called the World. You want to sort of talk us through that and what it what it brought to you? Well, uh, you know, I, I I like to move around. I like to travel. I like to meet different people. And one day, one of my old clients invited me to. She sold a business and brought on the single the world. Came to Sydney in February um, two thousand and. 2012, invited us on for lunch. We got shown around. In those days, the apartments were fairly reasonably priced. And I had a boat. We had a lovely boat with a crew. And you know, we've been up and down the coast and over across the Pacific. And I've had about 11 boats in my days. Really? Lost a lot of money. <laughs> but they've been great fun at the time. It's, it's exciting as hell when you buy one. It's a relief when you sell it. <laughs> but in, in between, it's a lot of fun. And I've enjoyed it immensely. I really enjoy it. And I like my game fishing up and down the coast. I really loved it. Anyway, so we, I said, well, let's buy an apartment and see. So we bought an apartment. And then we got on board and had a look around. And so how big is it? Give us a bit of an idea. That's 1,321 square feet. A three, uh, it's a three-bedroom apartment. And the size of the ship? Oh, the size of the ship. Oh, now you've got me. It's, 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 a, it's a small cruise ship, basically. But it's privately owned by all these apartments. You have penthouse suites, you have three bedrooms, two bedrooms, and different configurations and so on, and single bedrooms. Okay. Then you have five restaurants, and you have a podium, uh, you have an entertainment area, you have a coffee shop, and you have music. And, and we always invited on guest lecturers for every country we're visiting, talked about the geography, the politics, and the like. Wow. So you're, you know, and when you arrive in a country, because all these high net worth, most Government leaders invited you for functions and the like. I got met an incredible number of uh, extremely interesting people. Yeah. So it was quite a fantastic journey. And of course, then for my sins, I got asked to join the board. I got asked to be chairman. <laughs> and so you live amongst these people. The CEO lives in Florida, operations. So all the day-to-day -day problems they have, they ring you and debate everything with you. Everything's debated. So getting a consensus was an extraordinary effort and challenge. I put a lot of work and effort into it, but I enjoyed it because I like engaging with people. And these were people from all over the place, from Switzerland to the US to Europe to Japan to China, uh, Hong Kong, Australians. It was fantastic. So you made it to the uh, the title, Chairman of the World, did you? Chairman of the World, yeah. And that, <laughs> I got asked me to stay on for two extra years too, <laughs> which is the first time ever for a chairman. You normally only do it a year and they moved and turned over. So. so what did you learn? Are we all, are we all oh. similar? Are we all different? Are we all this? We, we have a certain idiosyncrasies that uh, are prevalent. Yeah. You know, Americans are much more out there, are much more outgoing, whereas the Europeans are much more circumspect. Yeah. And, you know, I'll give you a ex classic example. I was also a convener of the Plato Society where residents spoke to each other on different topics. And so I talked about China and geopolitics and stuff. And I had a, one day I had a session with a Frenchman, a German, an Englishman and a Scotsman on Brexit. Brexit. Yeah, and it yeah. was a robust, interesting discussion. Yeah. But I couldn't put couldn't put that debate together for Americans. They're so polarised. I couldn't put an American Republican, an American Democrat in the same room to have that debate. Wow. They got they got nasty and just didn't work. That's the, that's the problem. That's the real issue of concern. G generally, I, I, it was fascinating because they're engage all are very engaging people, different approach to life, and it's fascinating their perspectives risk takers, successful people, energetic. And that's what the beauty of it. All these trips we made, we visit everywhere. And you know, I used to fly back and forth to Australia regularly and they do that too. And the average, average guy stays on the ship about six months of the year. We stayed a bit longer, 10 months, because AOS chairmen had to be on board. And secondly, Australia's a long way away from everywhere. Yeah. With two new distance still applies. Many years ago, someone took an interest in you as a young bloke, as you said, and said, come on, I'm going to get my Very PA. fortunate to be a mentor, yeah. Yeah, to go down the road and get that, that first suit. You do you mentor people? I, I really enjoyed the mentoring program the ASX put together. Okay. It was for young women aspiring to be company directors. Okay. And I must say, I, I about seven or eight ladies that I mentored. And 
you know, it was just like, so much fun. I enjoyed it so much, sort of talking about their aspirations, what they had to offer. They have a lot to offer some of these women, extraordinary things. Only one I had to say he didn't really have the basic ingredients as the rest. And I, my task was to get them to understand what what a board environment's about, what the attributes are, or how you differentiate yourself in terms of what value you can bring. Yep. Very important to identify what your value proposition is, that you're collegial, you can work with people, you can develop consensus, you can express views. And I marked myself on how many directorships they got. I even passed up at one time, I got offered a job as chairman of the Northern Territories Tourist Commission. But I gave it to one of these young ladies. She likes to ring me now for these great places she goes to. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> but, you know, it's great to see them doing so well. What, what do you think of the whole diversity discussion? Well, I'm a great believer in diversity, absolutely. But so what is I take a strong view. Uh, you want the right people, the best people for the job. I don't, su I don't support this Californian approach where you must have X number of women by a certain point in time. You know, I don't support the idea of quotas. You know, women aren't cattle, and it's up for proper businessmen to understand that resources available to boards and the capability some of these women offer you. And so, I'm a great believer in the right. Look, to give one example at UGL, we were looking for a chairman of the audit committee, and I thought, oh, great, this will be a natural a female. This will be good. Turned out a guy. Migrated from South Africa to Australia. He'd been with Shell. He was a chemical engineer. He was a chartered accountant. Perfect for an engineering business. So he got the job, which surprised me. Then I was looking for someone with engineering background, oil and gas and the like. And a lady appeared that emerged as the best candidate. So I always, you know, look around for the, you know, to encourage a diverse search, but look around for the best person for the job. It's got to be the best person in the job. Because in the end, you're the agent of your shareholders. You're acting in their interest. You've got to get the right people. I don't believe in filling boards just uh, just because you know, of gender. But what do you think of the actual debate of late and the whole focus around social license? You know, you've seen the fallout with some well-known organisations in Australia. You've seen harassment come up as well. Where, where's it all going? Well, you know, I find this... Different to the old Solomon days, as you said, right? Yeah. It wouldn't, wouldn't last five minutes these, these days. I don't know. Uh, times have changed. Yeah. I am surprised at the behaviour of ex some ex executives in Australia. I thought we were better than this, but I guess that's what goes on. Yeah. I always seem to be too busy to run around chasing secretaries and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I, I suppose I would not be as etiquette, had the same etiquette as required now. The world's changed. It's up to business to understand that and change with it. That's the point. You know, the world's changing. It's like communications that comes at you so fast now. Yes. Remember in the old days, the economists used to verify every article before it published. They haven't got time now because social media. And so you've got to change with the times now. And that's what businesses do in terms of this culture that's emerging. Reputation's going to be very, very, be very careful of it, don't you? Who, I think Warren Buffett once said, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation. You can lose it in two seconds. And we've seen that happen here. For those up and coming executives, what should they be mindful of now, Trevor? Well, I think they need to be mindful of what is not only in the interest of its shareholder constituency, but the broader community that they represent in their activities. Yeah, okay. They must be conscious of diversity uh, as an exercise that needs to be pursued. And they've got to provide leadership. And that's a challenge in this day and age. It's more complex in this day and age. Governments need to wind back some of this the regulation. Boards have become really compliance officers in some instances now, particularly with the big four banks, because the government basically is underwriting the four banks. And these guys are basically compliance officers. And so consequently, it's a challenge. You're an optimist? I am. Winston Churchill once said, I'm an optimist, no point being anything else. Okay. So what are you thinking about the next five, 10 years? Are you, you said you sound like you sound fairly positive, but do you think things are gonna go well? I think there's a great opportunity if we are smart, yeah. think about what, what's happening out there, how the world's changed, understand these changes, understanding what's happening out there in the marketplace, the changes to social behavior. So the big thing, the social contract is under challenge too. Yeah, so right. you gotta understand what the implications of this, how do you position yourself here? And if you're thoughtful, there's a great opportunity. And you know, I remain optimistic, indeed. Where are you spending your time these days, Trevor? Well, I, you know, I retired from the ship uh, and then ran straight into the pandemic, been a bit locked down, unfortunately. Can't even get back to my own state. <laughs> so I've been a bit locked down. So I've been spending a bit of time, you know, on Rothschilds doing a few things with some clients. Yep. And, you know, I've got a couple of private investments in various ventures, both in the US 
in Australia and in Asia, particularly in the property area. Yep. I'm in a consortium there and uh, a few investments here in Australia, that businesses I like that, you know, usually in, for example, a recycling area or you know, some of these op opportunities are a bit unique and different. I'm fascinated by and I'm looking at a number of those. So that's what I do and I'm chatting about what other things I might do. I'd like, might, I might get back into the education sector somewhere because I loved education. Well, sp speaking of which, there's a bit of an irony of all this, isn't there? You didn't go to university. No, I didn't. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on, you know, this day and age, everyone putting out an ad, we saw the budget come out and support those under 35. And maybe, as you say, business does step up and it's going to put the adverts up and then come the, the CVs. The bosses are all going to say, make sure they've got a university degree. Hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I went to Pete Marks, I did my accounting. In those days, that was equivalent to a sort of getting a degree, but I never actually got a degree. Correct. And I thought about going back to uni. I even thought about just the last couple of months, maybe I should do something, but I haven't got around to it yet. Got other things to do. Look, unfortunately, tertiary education is crucial in this day and age. Complex is the world we have. And what, what, does, what does it do? It really teaches you to think. Yeah, That's all. Think about things. If you do that cleverly, you'll be okay. But the reason I started a vocational training company with two other people is so I was very concerned about the distinction in Australia that vocational training is, uh, you know, not as clever as being a t like tertiary education. People were more superior. Were superior. So oh, yeah. we created a, a yeah. training college. Yeah. I, t I remember I talked to John Howard and a few other premiers and said, yeah. "We'll create this. And they said, what we can do with the compliance." We'll give you a license. Yep. And I said, make it like a university. We had graduation. There's always some ministers better do a graduation. We want to make the kids feel important. Yep. And so we did online education on campus, on site, yep. and on the workplace. Yep. We both we went with a model. And I remember once sitting next to the then CEO of Rio Tinto, El uh, Tom Albanese. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was, because Rock Tolls do a lot of work with them, and I was going, I was all lined up to give you my big pitch at this dinner. <laughs> and he said, Trevor, forget that. He said, what you're doing at Careers Australia on this is fabulous. It's just, he said, I'm getting feedback. The students are not now, the kids and apprentices are now offering ideas. They're committed. They're enthused. Love it. You've got to do this more of this. I was totally blown away and I realized how good our model was. And we had a very capable guy running the business. Yep. And we had another guy who was ex Department of Education. Okay. And it was terrific. It went very, very well. I'm very big in vocational training as well. And but on, but on that, Trevor, have the schools got it right? And what, and what I mean by that, if you're 16 years old, you're good with your hands or you're good with your, your mind and doing it, you don't want to necessarily pursue uh, the next step into university. What am I doing sticking around at school? Well, I'm I really need to hang around for 17 and 18. And I don't think I'm know. qualified to give a, a judgment, but no, 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 all no, I can say is this. I've got a grandson doing cyber security Yep. IT course at uni. Okay. I've got a step grandson that's doing carpenter, doing a bloody good yeah, and he's own now, doing yep. incredibly well. Yeah, exactly. And so I've seen the what's happening in both worlds. Yep. And it's different. Both passionate about what they do and they're very good. But look, I've got a you know, if you don't have that degree of education, either through tertiary education or vocational training, you have a problem when you get a bit older. You can't grow without that founding, that education. And you, you, know, you learn so much in daily life. The question is, do we learn enough from the daily lives we live? Are we absorbing this enough? I don't know whether we are or not. Yeah, that's being a bit philosophical, but yeah. maybe, it, uh, maybe that's something we need to think about. Okay. Trevor, if you were to look back at that young Trevor, walking into that shop that time and seeing that gentleman, what advice would you give him now? Well, I've been a very fortunate young man. I didn't know what the real world was all about. I lived in a very narrow environment with my parents, given their social background. Yeah. And this mentor gave me an extraordinary opportunity. I then got offered positions to move. I never actually applied for any of these jobs. I was very fortunate. And you know, I, I, you know, I didn't want to leave Pete Moex. And I said to the senior partner, I love it. He's true. He said, look, I can see you've got some passion for this stockbroking finance business. He said, you can always come back. You're a great, you're one of the most enthusiastic accountants I've ever met. And so I went over there. I loved it. Then I, go over to, I took a risk and went to this job with this Arab Malaysian Development Bank. Yeah. 
Then I got offered a job in New York, and I took that risk, went to New York, loved it. You know, at the time I was pretty anxious, but I loved it. And came back to Sydney, and then went to Hong Kong, and then on the boards, I'm very fortunate. I was very lucky. You know, Morris Jr. was very kind of asked me to join the board, and he's a, he's a fine man and great leader and great company director. So he got an ASX, and Richard Humphrey was the CEO, if you recall. Fine group of people. Built a great stock exchange. We merged with the Sydney Futures Exchange. Great outcome. And so I've been there on the Future Fund, QIC. You know, Peter Beattie was a remarkably great man to work for. A lot of fun. You know, one of my fun premiers was Jeff Kennett. I went on a road show with Jeff Kennett and uh, his uh, treasurer, uh, oh, Alan, yeah. Alan Stockdale. That's right, yes. And it was a great act. You know, Jeff Kennett's enthusiasm and commitment to the state of Victoria. You know, he just, the audience were overwhelmed. And then Alan had all the detail. You know, he could answer every single question. Jeff didn't have to worry about it. It was a great trip with those guys, you know. And I liked that sort of enthusiastic and environment and, and dealing with various prime ministers. Like Keating was a, a unique individual, very great on ideas and, mm. and doing what he thought was right. Yeah. And these great leaders aren't hung up with their personal baggage. They can think laterally and the bigger picture. Leadership's crucial. So what advice leadership. would you give yourself? What advice? Well, <laughs> well, I sort of, as I said, I'm just a very fortunate young man who found his way forward. I was prepared to take so the advice I would say to anyone is that follow your instincts don't be frightened of you. And if you're, if you're not enjoying where you are, don't stay there. There's no point. Move on. You've got to be emotionally committed, personally committed, and you've got to enjoy it. On that, Trevor, thank you very much for thank joining us today. today. Thanks. You've been listening to No Limitations. Stand up for righteousness. Yes. Stand up for justice. Yes. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning.